Uh, you may know him as Floyd, Red O'Neill, Marvin, Stu, official number one, FBI director Ben Harp, David Blake, Rudy Bobrick, gay highwayman, Magruder, SWAT California, Earl, Captain Hendricks, Edgler, Foreman Vest, Bob Slidell, Jack Rose, Sergeant Sisk, himself in the very Muppets, the very Merry Muppets to Christmas, George York, Red Barber, or Wendell Jukes, but you may know him better as John C. McGinley. Please welcome to the stage, John C. McGinley! <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming for us, John. There we go. Oh, right on. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Thank you. So, John, you're here. I am. I was, uh, I, for, for 27 years, my brothers and I have been going, used to go with my father. There's three McGinley boys, and my father made a foursome. And we used to go to Ireland every year. My father took us in 1999. And it was a chance for the three boys to be with dad, which was fantastic because he was a salesman and he was very scattered and always had something to do. And so for us selfishly to have him to ourselves for those couple of days, it was fantastic. And the takeaway was uh, we got to do this every year. And so we did it in 99. And then, as everybody can imagine, it's almost impossible to get four different people to stop their lives for eight days and go halfway around the world. So... Uh, we skipped the next year. And so that was like 99 and then 2000. And then on that Tuesday morning, my brother Mark was in the second building and on, he was on 63, everybody on 74 up died. Yeah. And Mark made his way out uh, and he, he got a concussion on the way out and he stumbled up the FDR drive, which is the east side of Manhattan. Yeah. And he was missing for 12 hours. And it was impossible not to conclude that Mark had gone. Mm. And he did, he did show up. And one thing we swore after that was that when we fucking say we're going to do something, we're doing it. <laughs> and we haven't missed a year since. And oh, so uh, I've just come from being in Ireland with my brothers. And uh, uh, this, these dates worked out perfect. And so... This is a real thrill to be able to go from Dublin to over here and, and be with everybody. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's great to have you over here. Um, you've got family you, you, from Donegal originally? Yeah, we're from, from McGinley's are from Donegal. Uh, when you go up there and tour around, you see that the buses are all McGinley buses. Um, so I guess we have transportation in our blood. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Did you manage to get any golf out there while you were playing? In the whole theme of it is to, to play golf and then sit around and lie about how great we used to be. <laughs> You, did you grow up as a caddy as well? I read that you... Yeah, I caddied, caddied. in the U.S. Open and at, at uh, Baldus Roll. I had a, an amateur named J. Don Blake. And Baldus Roll is a club in uh, Springfield, New Jersey, about 21 miles outside of New York City. And I remember I didn't have... Uh, he didn't make the weekend, so we played Thursday and Friday. And then I went to the caddy master and I said, I, there's got to be a way for me to make a buck on Saturday and Sunday. And he said, yeah, go ahead, and you can be the, uh, the flag guy on the first hole. And so I went down at the first hole. And uh, as I was going, uh, a guy from Dolf Golf Digest stopped me, and he said, are you the flag guy in the first? You want to take an informal survey of balls that guys are playing? And I'm like, yeah. And so I was getting about 75 bucks to be the flag guy. And he said, what are you getting to be the flag guy? I said, I don't know, about $200. Um, and he said, well, all right, well, I'll give you $200 to do the survey. And so... <laughs> <laughs> I said, done. And so I'm standing there, and it's about 275 yards down, um, a, a par four for those guys. And I'm standing in front of the trap, and if the ball goes in the trap, you just go stand in front of the trap. If the ball goes in the grass, you go put a flag down. It's, it is what it is. So Arnold Palmer, in his last U.S. Open, he hits a fried egg right into the trap. And so I go stand in front of the trap, and he's coming at me, and Arnie's army, this massive group of people, was on the other side of the fairway. They weren't allowed on the left side. And so he's coming towards me, and it was very intimidating. It's one of the greats of all time. And I said, uh, excuse me, Mr. Palmer, what kind of ball are you playing? And without even looking up at me, he just goes, a Palmer. Because <laughs> he had his own ball, yeah. like Jack Nicholson. Did, did. I didn't ask anybody the rest of the day what they were playing. I just, I filled it out the way I took tests in high school, just random patterns. <laughs> and the guy came back at the end of the day and he goes, this, this is pretty accurate? And I'm like, oh, 
It's precise. <laughs> That's what these guys are playing. <laughs> the Palmer. So, so you started off with sport. Um, did, your, did your father play sport as well? Yeah, my father was a big time football player, American football. Yeah. And so we all did that. And uh, yeah, if we, we were never ever doing anything but sports. So, so how, did, how did you get into acting from that then? How did that? I thought out? I was a better athlete than I was. And when I got to university, I was not as good as everybody else. Um, <laughs> it was clear as day. Um, and I had always wanted to be a storyteller. And so I was up in upstate New York at Syracuse University. Mm -hmm. And I was in the journalism school and I was, I was writing tons and tons of copy. But as a sophomore, you're not allowed to say your copy. You have to the upperclassmen get to say it. And I just thought that was a bunch of bullshit. And so I transferred down to NYU and I, I studied there and in the grad program, which is a theater uh, a conservatory. And it was fantastic because by the time I was in the grad program in this theater conservatory, um, they take 45 of you and 15 years, 15 have to go a year. There's a mandatory attrition rate. And which was brilliant because it put the, fussing around factor at zero. So in other words, we had a guy who was uh, uh, morbidly obese, but a great actor. And they just said, because the mantra of the program was eight a week, which is how many performances you do on Broadway. You do six uh, nights and two matinees. And the mantra was eight a week. And so this guy, they said, you gotta just, you gotta lose weight. You have to come in at, at something that's healthy so that you can do eight a week. And uh, he didn't, and they kicked him out. They had another guy who was from Louisville, Kentucky, and they, the objective of the program is for you to leave with a stage standard. No, so in other words, you, when you speak, you should be able to speak without a regionalism in your voice. So if you have a Southern accent, you, you have to be able to get to a stage standard. And he couldn't, and they booted him. And I understand the criteria that if, if this is gonna be about eight a week, and you're going to hew to that mandate. Uh, there has to be some. There has to be a, a, a specific set of tools that you can hone in that program. And so I loved it uh, because I accumulated a, a, a bag of tools that I could plug in to different sets and rehearsal processes uh, over all these years. I loved it. So you went. You went from doing uh, stage. And then you got your first break, I think, with uh, Sweet Liberty? Yeah, I was doing, I was covering for John Totoro in a play called Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, written by the same guy who wrote Moonstruck, the film that Cher won for. Uh, his name is John Shanley. And uh, John Totoro was, is just a, a, a titan. He just would not skip a performance. He thought it was bad luck. And he finally got desperately seeking Susan with Madonna, which everyone in New York wanted to be in at the time. And he took a weekend off. And when he did, somebody from, a casting assistant from Oliver's uh, platoon uh, came to see John, but they saw me. And so I was invited to audition for platoon. And I got a tiny little role in this uh, version. I got a tiny little role of Tom Berenger's radio man and then the film went belly up. And for two years, the money went away. And so I kept doing plays and, and, and whatever I could as an actor. And I was, uh, I was studying, uh, we were doing Hamlet at the public with Kevin Klein, and I was third guy on the left, um, but I was understudying Laertes. So we were in well into the fight and Oliver calls up and he says, McKinley, are you going to do platoon? And he has this voice, it's way in the back of his throat, and he has this chronic fucking blink. And he's like, <laughs> McKinley. I'm like, Oliver, I'm doing, I'm doing Hamlet at the public. And once you got into the fraternity slash sorority of the New York Shakespeare Festival, no actor in New York would ever burn that bridge, ever. And so I said, Oliver, I, um, I'm doing Hamlet. And so he goes, and then the, the guy who was in charge of the Hamlet was named Joe Papp. And he was the man. He was, he, was the, he was the Wizard of Oz. And so he goes, go in and talk to Joe and tell him that I fucking need you in the Philippines. And I want you to play the fourth fucking lead. And I'm like, what? 
There's the record, the needle on the record. <laughs> so I go in to see Joe Papp, who always had this big burner going. And, and I, I set up an appointment to go in and meet him. And he didn't know me from Adam. And I went in and I said, Mr. Papp, uh, I got an a offer to go to Platoon halfway around the world. Uh, but I'm, I'm, we're two weeks into to Hamlet. And uh, he was a total mensch, which in Yiddish means a, a total, the, the greatest. He's the greatest. And he says, he says, Mac, and his voice is way back here, and he's got the cigar going. He goes, Mac, you go tell all of us, said hello. When you come back, we'll do something else. <laughs> I remember almost starting to cry because he was giving me permission to grow, yeah. which is un unbelievably gracious and, and unselfish and in the middle of freaking rehearsal. And so I did, I, I withdrew from the play and I was living in a funeral parlor at the time, uh, the Nucironi funeral parlor where Fiora, Fiorello LaGuardia was born. When you fly into LaGuardia airport, that's named after a mayor from like the roaring twenties in New York, a guy named Fiorello LaGuardia. Well, this was his, where he was born. Yeah. And the first two stories were dead people. The people who lived there were on three and four and I was up on five in this, an apartment maybe double the size of the stage. That's it. <laughs> but I was happy. It was happy. And so I go back there, and the minute I pull out of uh, uh, Hamlet, there's a revolution in the Philippines. Um, Ferdinand Marcos, who was the dictator slash president, re refused to leave after an election, like some jackasses in America. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> And so a woman named Cory Aquino won, and he wouldn't leave. And so there was a revolution, a bloody revolution. Mm -hmm. And so the film get, kept getting pushed back. And I, I'm sitting there in New York, having just pulled out of Hamlet, and months are going by. And I'm thinking totally selfishly, I'm like, could you get your revolution over with? <laughs> Are you a struggling I, actor at this point as well? I gotta, I gotta do, do this movie. I pulled out of Platoon. I pulled out of Hamlet. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm doing this. And who walks in one morning? I'm leaving. Who walks into the funeral parlor? But Cher, because they're shooting Moonstruck. And the one time we follow her to her, the exterior of her workplace, it's the Nucironi funeral parlor. <laughs> so shares coming in and out of my building. Uh, Hamlet opened up. It was the New York Times called it the most significant Hamlet on these shores. And I'm just watching CNN. <laughs> I'm just watching CNN. Are you panicking mm. at this point that you, your career is? No, I just felt like a loser. I had, I, <laughs> I had no. I'm like my judgment must be just the worst because I was in Hamlet, <laughs> and now I'm going to do. I'm, I committed to this low budget independent war movie. It was about a $6 million movie, and uh, it wasn't happening. Yeah. And, then, and then it happened, and it, and it worked out. Yeah, it seems like you're incredibly lucky with the people that you're around and you meet. I'm the single luckiest person on the planet. It's like because you're walking into the platoon, and you've got Defoe, you've got uh, Depps there when he was yeah, really Johnny young. and Forrest. Forrest Whitaker, to uh, with Tony, Tony Todd, who became, I've mentioned this before, became Candyman, and you're in another film with him later on. Uh, who else was on it? Depp, she oh, Sheen as well, Beringer. Uh, and what was it? What was it like? Was, was it different levels of acting ability, and did you learn stuff from them, or how did you feel when you walked onto that set? There was a three-week boot camp before we started, which was revolutionary at the time. And so we landed, and we had a day, uh, an afternoon to ourselves in revolution-torn Manila, and uh, where where thirteen-year-olds were walking around with AK-47s in the streets, just little boys with automatic weapons, and we were then sent to uh, the Philippine Jungle Constabularies Boot Camp and uh, just their, their property. And there were th three or four uh, American Marines, ex-Marines who were assigned to each squad. The squad's eight people. And so Berenger had a squad, Willem had a squad, and I had a squad. And we were each assigned a ringer, uh, a Marine. And we were in this boot camp for three weeks, which I loved. Um, and at the end of it, uh, we were supposed, the, the head of the, the, the ensemble, the highest ranking in the context of the movie, highest ranking person was a guy named Mark Moses, and he played the lieutenant. And so he was supposed to, over the three weeks, have learned how to use a compass and an azimuth 
which is a compass-like tool to read a map. All right, yeah. To get from A to B in, a, in, a, in an area where there are no roads. So you just have to use an azimuth and a compass. And so we were dispatched early, uh, I'll make it up, Friday morning, and we were supposed to go to point A, C, and then come back here. And so all on the shoulders of Mark Moses, who is an actor from Greenwich Village. He didn't know how to read a fucking azimuth. And so <laughs> we got so goddamn lost in this triple canopy jungle. And triple can uh, so there's, there's three layers of, of foliage. So it's dark. It's dark all the time. And so we're wandering around like a bunch of jackass actors and we're as lost as we could be. And finally, one of the ringers says, because now it's getting dark, and there's every sort of snake and spider and dangerous things you can think of in this rainforest. And the, the ringer, one of the Marines, uh, uh, says, we got to get up, we got to get up to high ground. I'm like, well, how? we're a bunch of actors. This, <laughs> there's not, no one here is in SWAT. <laughs> and so we got, they got ropes, and we climbed up to this, this very steep hill, and it turned out on top of this hill was a pineapple orchard. And so a couple of guys climbed up the trees with machetes and they cut down these pineapples. And we had run out of water six hours ago. And everybody was famished and scared. And we cut open these pineapples. And I can taste them right now. They were the most delicious things I ever tasted in my life. And we ate so much that we all got those calluses that you get on your gums and your, and your mouth when you eat too much citrus. Yeah. But it didn't matter because <laughs> we were full. <laughs> and then one of the guys sees a cow over there and he goes, should we go kill the cow and grill it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. You don't do that. <laughs> this the, is make pretend. I was going to say that. Is it, it's the, the film stuff. This is all make pretend. <laughs> but guys got, guys got in over their head. And Oliver, of course, loved that. Um, and then we had graduation the next day. They, somebody found us, and for graduation, uh, they gave us a couple of jugs of Philippine, Filipino um, uh, spirits, so 140 proof, whatever you call that, um, and it's called Lambanog. And so for graduation, when you came up and you shook the guy's hand, um, you put the jug here and you drank enough to not be embarrassed in front of your friends. And everyone got sideways. So, and it turned out there was more than three. And so we were up all night doing that. And then the next morning, Oliver shows up at about four and he puts us in, these creeks are called the blue. So a creek on a map is called a blue. So we were in the blue and everybody was just three sheets. and. That's how we started shooting the movie. And, <laughs> and guys had that long stare. They call it the thousand mile stare because this three weeks uh, had provided the actors with kind of a base of understanding that they could then take an imaginary leap and not necessarily that know the, the, the rigors of war, yeah. but hopefully an actor can take a transitional imaginary leap enough for the lens to understand that, that that's his truth. Yeah. I teach actors all the time and I tell them the easiest, the easiest thing to do when you're acting is tell the truth. The hardest is to lie. So if you can somehow move towards some sense of truth, I mean, I'm not Dr. Cox, but I could, I could move towards his kind of hidden compassion and his damage and kind of the fear that he operated on without anybody wanting to, he didn't want anybody to know. And I understand those couple of components and so I could move towards that. And when I did, that could tell my truth. Yeah. And so what Oliver did by putting us in that boot camp for three weeks was allow us to move towards something that we considered our truth, uh, which was that you were soldiers in 19, you were infantrymen in 1969 in, in Southeast Asia. So um, talking about the boot camp, I, I, I did some research about um, one of the one of the characters was actually a, a, in the Vietnam War, I think Dale. Yeah, Dale Dai. Dale Dai, and he said he said if he got another ten days with you, it could have made you actual uh, soldiers. But I wanted to talk about go back onto the sport and the um, the your physicalness because <laughs> we've been talking to a few people behind the scenes who you're quite a, a well built fella, aren't you? So I, I like to I I find it's uh, for me uh, actors spend most of their time 
their life with free time. Even, even if you're working, doing three films a year, there's a lot of downtime on sets, there's free time. Yeah. And I've always been a huge fan of structure. Yeah. And one structure is working out and staying fit. Uh, we've got some pictures of you there They're from American Gladiators. Oh, yeah. So if, you, if nobody my... knows, is that John was in American Gladiators and you competed. Yeah, I got my ass kicked. <laughs> By Superman. Yeah. So you are no Superman. By Dean Cain. Yeah, so yeah, if you can see up there, Dean Kane was up against him. What was that like? You said that you really enjoyed that. It was scary, but it was also weird because you're allowed to go. It's They shot it at Universal, which is over in Burbank. And it's this huge soundstage. And all the apparatus is all over the place. And so you're allowed to play on the apparatus and become familiar with it. Because at one point, you're crawling on the ceiling um, upside down with, with Velcro on your hands and you're... You're supposed to, it's a race and you're tethered into the ceiling and you're supposed to race around, along the ceiling like an upside down slot car. And so you're allowed to practice on the apparatus a Friday and then you come in and you shoot it on Saturday morning. So driving home on that Friday, O.J. Simpson had, was on the run in his white Bronco. Right, okay. <laughs> and all I can think about is all this apparatus I just spent this time on and the radio and all the highways are shut down because O.J. Simpson's in a goddamn Bronco. And I'm like, I got to get some sleep. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm an American <laughs> gladiator, man. I, I got to go to sleep. Could we clear up this O.J. thing? <laughs> <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> is that what you put down the, um, the fact that Dean beat you? Is that you were thinking I was sleep? just... I, that was really fun. You get you get twenty grand if you came in first, ten grand if you came in second, and five grand if you came in third. And I needed the money. That was a good gig. <laughs> I, didn't have any, I didn't have any money, and so I wanted I wanted to uh, at least Wait. come in second, and I did. I beat some NFL guy. Oh, the, Mike Adam. Yeah, it? yeah. Um, for wrestling fans, there's a guy with a fiend top on. I can see over there. Uh, Mike Adam Lee, who was a WWE commentator. Um, it, it, the sport features quite heavily in your life, and you are a Detroit Red Wings fan, I, I'm led to believe. How does that happen for a guy who's from New York and New Jersey? Well, uh, I, I live in Malibu now, and there was a guy who, who played on the Detroit Red Wings named Chris Chelios. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, played for the Red Wings and, and uh, the Blackhawks, and... He was a neighbor, lived about, I don't know, 500 yards from, from my house. And so I just asked the people at Scrubs if I could be a Detroit Red Wings freak. And <laughs> the guy who ran Scrubs, who now runs Ted Lasso, excuse me, uh, Bill Lawrence, he likes anything that makes the writer's lives easier. So if something in your real life is remotely engaging and interesting, it's in Scrubs. Cool. So you got, you got a little bit of license to... Um... Yeah, so in other words... Uh, one of the, my other neighbors was, and my dearest friend on the planet is Johnny Cusack. And Johnny w at that time was going through some kind of th adjustments because he was just acting like a, a big fat queen. And so we just started <laughs> calling him girls names because he was just <laughs> being this precious thing. And so I just, we'd always call him girls names. And Billy Lawrence, the guy who ran scrubs, heard me calling Cusack girls names. And he said, you should call Zach girls names. And I'm like, Okay, he's a girl anyway, so I'll, I'll just call him girl. <laughs> so that was easy. So there's that, and I read that there's three things that you were allowed to improvise on scripts. So there was the girls' names, uh, or that you added to it. Was a whistling as well? Yep, and then also I did this thing. Um, I had done a film with uh, Paul Newman and Johnny Cusack down in Durango, Mexico, 8,000 feet up in the Sierra Madres. Uh, with a British director, Roland Jaffe, who directed The Mission and The Killing Fields. And his third film was about the making of the atomic bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy, which is were the names of the atomic bombs. And what was happening in Los Alamos, Mexico, for the three years before the bombs were dropped. And I got to be with Paul Newman for, uh, I don't know, five months. And he uh, impacted me the way you would like a icon to impact you. Just the... He was all that. He was who you wanted him to be. There are others who I'm not going to tell you who are oh. not who you wanted them to be. <laughs> um, I heard that as well. There's, there's, um, that Bill ha has an arsehole rule. Yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. But yeah. when I was with Newman, Newman did this thing um, in The Sting with Redford. When the coast was clear, they did this thing with, they just, just meant the coast was clear. And I gave Cox that. 
And it also sometimes functioned as me vamping to try to remember the next goddamn line because I remember <laughs> I was trying to trigger a memory of what, of what the next line was. Um, and the no asshole policy, which I've put on, uh, on my set, I produced a bunch of movies and TV shows. And you bring every, Billy brought everybody into the cafeteria, which was the biggest room at, in this defunct hospital, but where we were shooting. We weren't on a soundstage. We were in a real hospital that was no longer functioning. And he, uh, a TV crew at that time was about 145 people. And he brought everybody in. And this is a, the opposite of a confrontational guy. He sprints from confrontation. And he just told everybody, uh, we're going to have a no asshole policy on this thing. And all he meant was, it, everything goes back to grade school, right? Is he, when you come to work, be nice. Yeah. And if you can't, you're going to be gone. And he wasn't acting like a tough guy. He just, he knew something we didn't. And that was, we were going to be doing this for a while. And that hospital was old and stinky and confined. And you had to be nice to each other. Yeah. You got to be nice. If you can't be nice, then uh, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, also, we're going to move on to films and TV stuff that you've done. Um, so just giving James cues so that he can switch the things behind us. Um, so, you've been in this... I, I had to do so much research, and there's so many films you've been in. And I've, I've went back and said, so you've got point... I got a lot of overhead. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's going to get paid. But Point Break, Highlander 2, one of my, one of my favourites. Uh, Article 99. I want to switch quick uh, chat about Article 99 because that's, that's about doctors as well. And that was yeah, it felt with... like in a weird way, uh, a precursor to Scrubs. It yeah. wasn't, uh, but it, it tone-wise was. It's a farce in a hospital mm. with Ray Liotta and Kiefer Sutherland and uh, Forrest, Wick. Forrest was in it. Yeah. And so there was another, oh, and, and, and Keith David. So it was kind of a, a platoon reunion of sorts. And we were in Kansas City, which is a great town at this veterans hospital. And it was just about moving, they call it turfing. When, when someone doesn't have insurance, uh, you turf them in a different floor. So if they need a, if they need a liver transplant, um, that you article 99 them, you turf them in um, cardiac yeah. for cardiac things. But it, that was a great gig. The, that, like, that film's about 120 minutes and 100 minutes of it are great. And then it just loses its way a little bit in the last 20 minutes. But it seems that a lot of the stuff that you were doing was had like a very moral tone as well. Yeah, but I was also, I wanted to go, I was under the impression that once you got on uh, the movie train, if you were enough to get on the, the train uh, euphemistically, that you're on that thing and, and people need you on the next film, I didn't want to get off. Yeah. I thought, so I just took, uh, if I was off a film, I did it. I'm going to say, you've got some great deaths. So, uh, I was doing about four films a year for a, for a while there. There's, um, there's my, favorite, my favorite death of yours is Highlander 2, uh, where you get grabbed by the balls and thrown out of a window. Michael Ironside, yeah. Yep, and then also on Deadly Ground with Steven Seagal, where you get pushed into uh, the... Uh, he's a piece of work. So, <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this guy's a beauty. <laughs> Warner Brothers decided that Steven was, was peaking at his popularity, and he was a big star, yeah. and so... Uh, we're up in Valdez, Alaska, and I see this bu Valdez, Alaska, which is in the, the northernmost point of Prince William Sound. And there's a landing strip where you come in from Anchorage. And I remember going, and the landing strip is um, right near where the apartments are, where you're going to live. And so we're there, and Warner's brothers decided they were going to let Stephen direct this thing. Now, he hadn't directed fucking traffic, and they're going to give him the reins to an $80 million action movie. And so Michael Caine and I are the bad guys, and so I hero worship Michael, and so I just went out of my way to spend as much time with Michael as I could over the next four and a half months. And so that was the upside of that movie. Yeah. The downside was that uh, it was, it's hard being on a set that's rudderless. Right. And so we finally were towards the end of the movie, and I'm going to get my, there's a, a prop going around. Um, my character gets his head shoved in a prop uh, from, a from a plane. Yeah. And so um, uh, the, stunt, the stunt, coordinator, stunt coordinator comes over to me and says, how comfortable are you, what kind of proximity do you want to be with a prop? And I'm like, I don't want to go near it. I'm, 
you get my double. You're going to shoot behind my back anyway. And he's like, well, Steven really wants you to get close. And I'm like, well, I'm not. So <laughs> this, is, this is the dumbest conversation I've ever had. <laughs> and so, and it's, you know, it's a prop going around and, uh, and the camera's behind it. And so he goes, well, Steven's going to want to talk to you. And I'm like, well, fucking send him in. I've got, I'm telling you right now, I'm not going near the goddamn prop. And so in comes Stephen, who also t talks way in the back of his throat. And he goes, I think sometimes people talk this way because they think it's going to make you lean in and listen to them a little more. But I'm not listening to him. He's an idiot. And so, <laughs> and it's four in the morning, and, and we're down way past LAX at where all that, that refinery is down towards Long Beach, California. And all the, everyone's tired, and it's four. And here I have this guy coming in my trailer. And he goes, John C., do you love your father? I'm like, what did you just say? He goes, do you, do you love your father? I'm like, yeah. That's the strangest fucking question I've ever heard. He goes, I'm your father. <laughs> love me. I'm like, this is such a bunch of bullshit. You want me to get close to the prop, and I'm not getting near the prop. And he goes, you may wreck the film. I'm like, Stephen, I'm not going near the prop. And guess what? They get the double to do it and the angles so that the double was never more than this close. And I was never as close as that. As that. I'm like, <laughs> uh, you can, it's movie magic, Stephen, movie magic. <laughs> Everything doesn't have to be real. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so from somebody that you, that you weren't too keen on, um, I, was, I went and found, there's a clip on YouTube of, you were in seven, not for too long, but you're in seven. And Fincher and Pitt do the commentary the director's commentary for that. And they, there's a brilliant quote about you. And it goes, what is it? it goes, there's our boy, funny, funny, funny. And he goes, he's hamped there. He brings an incredible amount of intensity to everything. And they sound like they were so happy to have you on the set, but you, you didn't seem to have that much of a role, to have that much of an impact on those two. I went into audition for that and I really wanted to be in it. But California was written as a Latin male and nothing says... Latin male like John C. McGinley. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in to meet David because he was incredible. And the guy who was the producer and the entree into this was Arnold Culpeson, who had produced Platoon. And we both had wildly positive impacts on each other's lives. And he said, just come in and meet David. I'm like, but it's written, California's a Latin male. And he goes, just come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. And so I did, and we hit it off in the room. And he rewrote it to, you know, a donkey. And uh, Brad and I went to, this is cut from the cloth of Oliver doing a boot camp. We went to the LA Police Academy for about a week and a half and just, you know, got familiar with weapons. And uh, that was a, it was a great, great gig. It, it, it seems like sometimes, like, um, I was trying to watch how you act. And it's, it's almost like liquid, liquid acting, because you just seem to, you're, cadence and your rhythm and it just seems like bah, 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 and it's, you seem so comfortable uh, if something's screen. as specific as being this amped up SWAT guy in seven mm. and you get access to the SWAT guys um, and then you can borrow liberally yeah. from things that are going to resonate and so that and I have a pretty good ear for rhythm and sound and so I, I lean into that has that, that translated? I wanted to very briefly talk about um, stage as well. You did, uh, you worked with Pacino, and then you did Glen Gary, Glen Gary, Glen Ross on Broadway. What was that like? Yeah, about five years ago, uh, they called up and they said uh, they're doing a, a revival of Glen Gary, and Al is going to play in the movie the Jack Lemmon role, yeah. and uh, Bobby Cannavale was going to play Al's role from the movie, and my friend Richard Schiff uh, and David Harbour and this all-star cast. And uh, they said, you, you, you're you being offered Dave Moss. And Dave Moss is Ed Harris in the movie. And he's the straw that stirs the drink. He's the one who organizes the robbery of the, the leads. Yeah. And uh, we were at the Schoenfeld, which is on 44th. It's a very vertical, uh, small theater. In other words, if you go see um, Lion King, it's about a 4,000 seat barn. Yeah. The Schoenfeld's only about 1,100 seats. So by Broadway standards, a very tiny house. And we all <clears throat> agreed to do 100 performances. So it became a very in-demand ticket in New York. 
And uh, it was the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. It was the hardest and most exciting thing I've ever done. Did you up your game for that as well, or is it just I created, second nature? <clears throat> I live in Malibu, and I created a theater boot camp for the two months before I went. Because I come on stage in the first act, and I try to convince Richard Schiff to rob the office yeah. with me. And I don't stop talking for 18 minutes. And <clears throat> it was I used to hire these kids, these young actors, to come up, and I keep a, a rehearsal space in Malibu. And I would have them just do the, the lines off. And they weren't allowed to make any, any, I didn't want their opinions. They're just little kids, you know, just, you know, young theater people. Yeah. And I put a metronome in the rehearsal space, and sometimes I did it at a certain pace, and then other times I did it at another pace. Um, I learned how to do the line standing on a, a gym ball and juggling. And that's <laughs> because I knew phones were going to go off, sirens, sirens would go right through that wall, because it's right on 44th Street. Yeah. Uh, I knew everything, and phones went off every night, <clears throat> and it didn't matter. I was so locked in when we got there that it, it was the greatest experience of my life, by far. Speaking of which, greatest experiences for a lot of people here, Scrubs. Uh, what was it like? So you've, you've gone in and you're sort of talking about how you've rehearsed for that. What was it like being cast? How, what did you have to do? What was the, the, the end to that? How did that all begin? Well, the most ironic that? thing about Scrubs... <clears throat> and if Bill Lawrence, who again was the creator of Scrubs and creator of Ted Lasso, <clears throat> if Billy were here, he'd tell you. They sent me the pilot, which is the first episode, and in it, it said, Dr. Cox enters, and then in parentheses, it said, a John C. McGinley type. <laughs> I had to audition five times. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm him. I'm the guy in the parentheses. <laughs> Why? But in TV, there's so many chefs in the kitchen and every time you climb a rung, so this was produced by Disney and it was on NBC, the channel NBC yeah. in, in, in the States. And each of those uh, different entities gets to voice an opinion. And so I auditioned for Scrubs five times, even though it was a John McGinley type. <laughs> how, how annoyed would you have been if it had gone to somebody else? Oh, that wouldn't have been right, man. <laughs> Did you, did, I heard that you might have turned it down as well. Did you, did you get it when, as soon as it was offered to you, did you take it? Or? Well, just negotiating with Disney is like talking to a stone. And so <laughs> you have to play a hardball in negotiations. Right, okay. And so, yeah, a couple of times we said, we're not doing it. Uh -uh. And I was going through a divorce, and those were sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> but then you got it, and you were sat in the... Well, the best thing about Scrubs was that uh, my son was born a couple of years before Scrubs started, uh, Max, who's now 24. And Max was born with Down syndrome. He's in great shape. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, I couldn't do four films a year anymore and be on the road. I did be near Maxie. Yeah. And so, and this is going to sound strange, but <clears throat> there are hardly any gigs in Los Angeles anymore. They're all up in Toronto and in, they're elsewhere where tax incentives, Georgia, where somebody else got the memo the states where tax um, incentives have, they call it runaway production, all these productions of runaway. And Hollywood, you don't shoot stuff in Hollywood anymore. And Scrubs was right over in Burbank, which is uh, next to, uh, to Hollywood. And I wanted to be near Maxi. And yeah. so that was the greatest, for me, that was the greatest gift of Scrubs. Yeah. I got to be around Maxi for almost 11 years, the run of that show. Uh, I never had to go anywhere. When did, you, when did you realize it was going to be a success and it was going to carry on? When did you think, this is it, I've broke it? Um, by the end of the second year, they offered us all to renegotiate our contracts, and they gave us three-year contracts for years uh, three, four, and five. And uh, they gave us a bump in pay, which Disney never does. Um, but, yeah, year three. Because they had us on after Friends, so that was kind of the... the premium lead-in at the time back when people used to not change the channel they just watch a comedy block yeah. of programming <clears throat> and so we had that as a lead-in and of course we didn't do their numbers but at one point they were doing 22 23 million dollars 23 million people every thursday night yeah. and we'd get half of that at 20 at 12 which today would make you the biggest hit on tv um, but so we were a top 10 show it was it was a it was an insane run. 
And what were your memories of the, when you first went in to met the rest of the cast? Because you said it was, it's, it's actually... Oh, I have a memory, I'll tell you. So the first year, NBC was really, really promoting the show hard. Uh, and so <clears throat> and it wasn't a hit yet. But uh, on Thanksgiving in the States, which is usually around November 24, uh, there's a big parade in New York City, the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade, where there's the balloons and shit up and all this. <laughs> and... So we work until some ungodly hour uh, on Wednesday night. Then they bring us down to LAX. They put us on a plane. We all feel like we're masters of the universe. We're sideways drinking. And <laughs> then they deposit us on the Upper West Side somewhere where the parade starts. And we're at some church. And we're all laying on the pews and trying to recover. And Max and I at the time we're watching a lot of The Wiggles, which is a, a, a group from Australia. These four guys, they're unbelievable, they're great. And I would subsequently become friends with them. But well, I was- You all know who The Wiggles are, don't you? I had The Wiggles up to here. It's, I knew The Wiggles. And their signature kind of prop is a, something called the big red car. It's just red Volkswagen they all pile into and they, it transports them to adventures. I get out of the church, a little hungover, and I go over to, we're on this quasi-racist Pocahontas float <laughs> where, where there's a woman dressed up as a Native American Indian. She wasn't a Native American Indian. Yeah. And there was this other guy who was an explorer who probably killed all the Native American Indians. And we're supposed to be there on this quasi-racist float doing this thing. And so I'm standing on the platform they showed me. And I look behind us just to check it out. And there's the big red car. And I, we, with the Wiggles on 24-7. And so I got off the quasi-racist float, and I walked back to the big red car, and I introduced myself to the Wiggles. <laughs> and we became friends. <laughs> I love the Wiggles. Was Max made up? Uh, Max has subsequently met them backstage, and it was, it was like a, a, a Catholic meeting Jesus. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it was genius. <laughs> Best dad ever. Mm. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> like you say then, uh, there was a, quite a diverse cast on there because you, we had friends before which sometimes gets um, tighted as sort of like it didn't have a lot of diversity in it and, and Frasier I think was your leading at some point as well and that's kind of very white and yeah, upper all class. Yeah, people this. You're right, Scrubs uh, was diverse. Yeah, and I was, I, was, I was only thinking about this the other day because you've got uh, two black characters and one isn't African American. It's sort right, of like Judy. Judy is different and then you've got all these different players that are in there. What was what was that like when you're doing the read-throughs at the beginning? Second, second nature. Just that, that ensemble was so good and Billy did such a good job casting that show mm. that... Uh, it, it was a lot of those characters, I think it was like rolling out of bed. They were just spot on. And yeah. on TV, you don't get a thousand takes. You got three or four and we got to go. Move um, on to the next one. Then. And what I learned, <clears throat> the first thing uh, I got to, that was paying the bills right before Platoon and in conjunction with um, Hamlet, I got a day or two a week out in Brooklyn where there's a lot of sound stages um, and they shoot the daytime soaps. And one that was running forever was Another World. And I got Another World uh, for a couple of years, like a day a week. And the, the thing about Another World and soaps is you shoot two a day, two 60-page episodes a day, which is a lot. Yeah. And you, you start to develop that muscle, that memorization muscle, which I, I would suggest you can strengthen. Mm. Uh, and so you get good at it because what happens on soaps back then was that there, there were three cameras. There was a, a single on you, a single on me, and a master on both of us. Yeah. And if you can't remember your lines, they just cut to me listening. And then they loop your lines. They do your, uh, just do your voice later. Yeah. But they cut to me listening. And so that was the really interesting little tool that I picked up. Learn your lines. Right now, learn them. Because we got to go. And if we don't, we'll just cut to somebody listening. And the other funniest thing about going out to Brooklyn um, was that I lived in the funeral parlor at the time, and a teamster would come and pick me up because they wanted you to be there on time. And you'd get in the town car, and you really felt like somebody. And then when you were wrapped out in Brooklyn doing Another World, you were given a subway token to get back into Manhattan. Because <laughs> we don't need you anymore. Bye. And the first time they did it, I was just like, where's the teamster? I thought, like, no. I'm a star. Token. 
Yeah. I'm a star, yeah. <laughs> Living in a funeral parlor. So, so what was it? Uh, did you develop lots of friendships? And, and it seems like it's a family uh, on the set of Scrubs. And... Yeah, look, uh, by, by Monday night, we were a day or two behind for, for every week. And so Tuesdays started, would always be like a 14-hour day. And then Wednesday was 15. And then we were always shooting into Saturday afternoon um, from Friday. And so that's why the no asshole policy was really important. Uh, we were, there's a finite number of hours in the week and we were spending much more time with each other than our families. Mm. Uh, and that's just the way it was. Uh, but, but it was great. I, I loved it. Are you still in touch with most of the cast? Or? Yeah, Donald and Zach are doing something called Fake Doctors, Real Friends. It's a podcast. I highly recommend it. Uh, and where they go back and do a deep dive into each episode. Oh, each nice. single podcast is about an episode. And they'll bring an actor on or they'll bring one of the producers or the writers. Yeah. And since I was in my room memorizing everything all the time, and I missed most of the hijinks that were going on the set because I don't like hijinks to begin with. But I was always memorizing these rewrites. I'd always get these rewrites. And so I missed most of the things they're talking about on this podcast. So I listened to it and it cracks me up. Finding out stuff that got on behind your back then. Well, it wasn't behind my back. I just didn't want to participate. I wanted to learn my goddamn line. <laughs> Have you got any, any good memories of like, the guest stars coming on or the favorite moments of uh, Dr. Cox? That you... Michael J. Fox coming on was pretty special because we all, you know, grew up watching him and he, he was pretty amazing. Uh, Julianne Margulies coming on was pretty great. Dick Van Dyke was amazing. Um, oh, and I got to make out with Heather Locklear. So, yeah, that sounds good. Uh... <laughs> that didn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I have to get up and do this acting okay. thing again? Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was a good experience all around. And you got the, the most important thing for you is that you got to spend a lot of time with Max. Yeah, um, I mean, it would be preposterous to think you were going to have a gig in Los Angeles for 10 years. They just don't exist. Because what happens with shows on TV is that when, when the executive in charge of the network green lights your show, he or she wants to prop it up and get credit for it and, and stay on but they don't ever stay on, they all get fired. So when the new network head comes in, he or she has to create their own content because Scrubs wasn't created on the new person's watch. And so there's a house cleaning every fall and Scrubs made it through about four or five different network heads, which is unheard of. And so I don't know how, but it did. That's why we're here now. Right on. I think we're all, I think we're all grateful, aren't we? For that, yeah. Uh, um, so I want to I mentioned Max before. I've got two couple of more topics to go. I wanted to talk about your family life because you've mentioned Max before. Uh, Max, there he is on the left. And yeah, yeah. No, oh, and the my daughters well. Billy Grace and Kate and Nicole. Um, and there's Maxie in good shape. Yeah, and, and um, like you're saying, he was, he, uh, Max was born with Down syndrome, and you're a, a big advocate for the Special Olympics and for uh, the Global Down Syndrome Foundation as well. You want to talk a little bit about that for us? Well. What the, there's a couple of dirty little secrets with Down syndrome. One of which is that our population um, will, if they live long enough, which you will now, if you were born with Down syndrome, we we will get Alzheimer's. And so all our research dollars in Denver, where I'm on the board of the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, goes to Alzheimer's research. Uh, and so that's. That's instead of everything being, I've been with groups where everything's kumbaya and let's hold hands and write pamphlets, and that's great. But the Alzheimer of it all is like kind of Lady Pac-Man, it's coming. And that's a hard pill to swallow. You know, everybody wants to know what the future is, and in this case, you get to know. And so Max will eventually develop uh, symptoms uh, that mirror uh, Alzheimer's or in fact Alzheimer's and so that's what's in our future and for baby boomers there's an avalanche of Alzheimer's coming that our research shows uh, at the Global Down Syndrome Foundation and there's no infrastructure in place for it nobody knows what the hell Alzheimer's is except for brain plaque and it's it's almost like this we're a bunch of big deniers and so all our money is going towards research for Alzheimer's. And that feels like a productive way 
to try to uh, uh, contribute to our to the Down syndrome community. And then with the Special Olympics, I was lucky enough to be the, at the World Winter Games um, in Boise, Idaho, 10 years ago now. And the athletes all have something called a youth leadership conference that is a component of all world games. And it's where about 150, 200 athletes get in a room and just table issues that are, that are relevant to, to where they are. And to a man and woman, they all hated the word retard and retarded. And so we crafted a campaign called Spread the Word to End the Word. And it was a viral campaign that didn't purport to tell you how to speak, because that's all you have to do to Americans is tell them how to speak. And they go nuts. But what it, what it suggested is there might be a better way to say what you just said, because it's hurtful. And even if you're not aware of it, maybe uh, I can make you aware of it and we can have a discussion about it because there's no consequence, there's no tax, there's not a toll that, that the transgressor suffers from uh, when you disparage the special needs community. Uh, because our people, that's not, we're trying to get through the goddamn day. And so, in other words, if you disparage some of my Italian friends or my African American friends with foul language, there'll be a consequence. If you disparage the Jewish community, and rightfully so, whether it's a strike or, or, or you know, a social media avalanche. If you dis disparage my Jewish friends, there's a consequence, not with a special needs community. And there should be a consequence. What, what is it? Just being aware that that really hurts and it sticks to us and it stigmatizes us. And these are pe people who have never done anything. A bit of common decency, basically, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the, I, think, I think the road into decency isn't, isn't, the road of morality. I think it's discussion. Yeah. And if someone goes, oh, I didn't know, then now we're having a discussion. Yeah. And if you choose to still use that language, then you're a jackass and uh, use the language. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, how, how is it being a dad at the moment? Because you've got a, a widespread of ages there because Max is 24 <clears throat> and these girls are 13 and 11. Yeah, well, what's been interesting early on was that Max's biggest challenge is language, spoken language. And he gets away with a lot of gesture, which I've always tried to shape into language. But that's a challenge that we, we, didn't, we didn't solve. And so how to continue to challenge Max at, at such a fundamental level of language while not um, elevating the girls' game? as they go, because they're two different learning curves. And so that's been a really fascinating um, um, course that we've charted. So as a takeaway uh, for everybody here and for myself, is there anything we can do or to uh, research or just, is it just the discussions and talking about it? Just be inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> it's so <laughs> simple. Yeah. Uh, so finally, I wanted to move on to what's coming next uh, or what's going on at the moment. Um, we've just come out of a pandemic and you're currently doing Brooklyn Nine-Nine. That's yeah, I showing did the last, I did the last season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. The final season as and well. That was a really good gig in the middle of the pandemic. And so what was interesting there is that we were over where Mary Tyler Moore was uh, shot over towards uh, Studio City. And every day, if your call was six o'clock, um, you f spent the first two hours in different protocols. And so that ate two hours out of a 10 hour day. And so the pages were diminished. The producers were very smart. So in other words, if you usually do a 12 page day on a TV show, they reduced it to six because the, the ensemble and the cast and crew were all in, they had to go to tent A. I mean, we've all done this now. Yeah. And get your nose swabbed and then go to tent C and spit in the thing. So when was and, this filmed then? Was this like right in the middle of the pandemic when you were filming it? Yes. Or, oh, and then do, you know, go and wait for your results, and then you can go to hair and makeup. Yeah. But you can't go in that trailer until you've done what usually took about two hours. Yeah. I'm sure it's streamlined now. Uh, but this was in the middle of it, and it was a great gig because the page count was so reduced and so smart. So there was no, once you got on the set, you could accomplish, you, you could stand on your head and do five pages a day. And so it was great. Uh, it was uh, very strange having to, you're not allowed on the set. Um, once the actors are done, somebody calls cut, they have to go sit in that tent out there so the grips and electric can come in. 
And so there were different um, groups that were allowed on the set at different times. And so it, it kind of made it a little antiseptic, shooting it, not, not between action and cut, but the, the mechanics of shooting it was very strange. And I hope that's not the new normal, but uh, it was for that. And the fact that that ensemble is so, so nimble uh, allows that show to float. I was going to say, the, the character that you play, Frank O'Sullivan, is a great character. And it's quite a deep sort of storyline. You're right. And so this is the head of the New York Police Department. And in America, uh, for the last couple of years, uh, from George Floyd to, unfortunately, dozens of other African-American men have been murdered. Mm -hmm. And so uh, having the head of a police department um, funny is a slippery slope. Yeah. And so... There's this great character in Commedia dell'arte, uh, the, the clowns, the Italian clowns, and one's name is Buffuno. And so I got with um, a teacher friend of mine, and we started to explore. And Buffuno always is his worst enemy. He is a buffoon. And so I took from Buffuno, and I, uh, I took a really dead serious guy and made him a fucking buffoon. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And there's a theme that goes through some of your characters because he's a massive fan of Billy Joel, isn't he? And then in, in Office yeah, the Space... Yeah, the writers wrote that. It was great. <laughs> and then in Office Space, Bob Seidel, he was a massive fan of Michael Bolton. Oh, yeah, that was funny. And <laughs> is that a thing from you? Because I know No, you... no, that's, those, are the, those are the writers. All right, okay, so... <laughs> those are the writers. But you're a big Bruce Springsteen fan, though. I am. I saw him on Broadway right before the pandemic, and it was the single greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was unbelievable. So, so, weeping. Oh. Weeping. So, so, so that isn't a big thing that you, you like bad music in the things that you play, but you like Bruce Springsteen. Is that so I like bad music, too. All right, okay, okay. <laughs> I was wondering how to put I like that the there. karaoke, man. But it, also, you talked about damaged, damaged characters as well and, and trying to find the heart of characters like Dr. Cox and... Um, I think uh, even Red O'Neill in Platoon, it's sort of like there's a part yeah, but Dr. of Dr. Cox was, was so clear to me because um, I, I wanted to bring Max with me in my heart to work every day. Yeah. And I thought Dr. Cox, if he took himself too seriously, would just be a bully. And I, I hate bullies. Mm. And so what I, what I did with Cox was by virtue of having Max in my sternum, um, Cox could function from fear and, 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 and from a need to be included and, and not wanting anyone to know any of that. And so that's next level, and the lens sees all that. Even though it's not in the text, you never say it, but the lens just devours that. And I didn't do it for the lens, I did it for me, so that I could let this thing resonate and let such a damaged guy be reconciled. I had to reconcile this guy. And so I brought Max into it, in my brain and in my heart. And so, so what is, uh, just to conclude now, uh, we're gonna do a Q&A in a second where everybody can ask the questions, get your questions ready. Um, so what's, what's been the high point of your career or what have you taken from what you've done? What's the favorite thing that you've done? I would say being able to have a platform where I can advocate for people who can't advocate for themselves is a privilege I never thought I'd be afforded. And doing all this stuff is great, but it, it's allowed me to advocate for a community that uh, can't advocate for itself. And that's where I, that's where I find elevation. Fantastic. Uh, on behalf of the Monopoly staff, on myself and all the crowd, thank you very much, John C. McGinley. Right on. Right on. So now, what we're gonna do, if, uh, James, have we, got, um, have we got another mic? We got uh, hello, hello. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask the audience now. I can ask any question within reason, obviously. Um, but any questions from the audience? If you want to put your hands up, uh, we're gonna get one of the staff members to come over. If we start with yeah, if you start nearest here. Thank you. What's your question? What's your name? Hello. What's your question? Oh, Jack. Hello, hello. Jack. Um, so just wondering, from uh, playing a characters with such depth as Doctor Cox, one that you clearly love playing, did you find that it was difficult to move away from the character? And um, no, only because uh, after nine years and almost 200 episodes, we, if you hadn't gotten that out of your system, it begs the question, what were you waiting for? And 
I would love, if there's a reunion or something, I'll do it tomorrow. But by the end of those nine and a half years or so, we had rung that, we had rung that out pretty good. Yeah. And I, I was looking forward to seeing if I could leap into something else. I knew I could, but uh, I didn't know if you guys would buy it because Cox became, you know, pretty popular uh, guy. And uh, I wanted to, obviously I wanted to be an actor and do other stuff. And so pr pretty quickly the, the chance to do a Broadway play came along uh, and that felt like it validated everything in my brain th that I could leap to the next thing. Because the guy I played on Broadway was not Dr. Cox. <laughs> he was a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> do, you mind, do you mind when people sort of, um, sort of can't, not, not blur the lines, but do you mind when people shout, shout catchphrases or... No, you got to remember, I, I was broke living in a funeral home waiting for a, a revolution to finish. <laughs> this is all fucking gravy. <laughs> I mean, come on. I've seen a clip of you on Conan where you talk about how much you love gravy as oh, well. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> you're a gravy guy. I'm a gravy guy. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, thanks for your question. Um, we'll go to this guy here. And the, go, we'll come to you, and then there's a person there, yes. It's all right, I can, uh, uh, we will get to you. We've got, we've got half an hour, so don't worry. So this guy here. If you just want to say your name and then just ask a question. Uh, with the third, we'll just put you on there. Thank you. All right, John, my name's Luke. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you here tonight. I'd just like to thank you on behalf of everybody for coming out to us today. It's fantastic. Right on. So your career on the silver screen, it's one most ornate, filled with much prestige and diversity. Having said that and played, you've played so many colourful and decorative characters over the years. Which would you deem your magnum... Opus, which is your best character, in your opinion, and for what reason? Uh, it would have to be between uh, Cox, uh, just because you got to do it so long, and the writers got to explore so many different eccentricities that really resonated for me, and that they integrated c kind of the, the closeted love I wanted to bring with Cox, very, that, that that was his secret weapon. That's what made him a superhero. But he didn't want anybody to know which is such a delicious contradiction and such a, a variable of torture, which is what the guy did. He just, was a, he just tortured himself. And um, so I would say between Cox and, and getting to play Dave Moss on Broadway, I fucking crushed that play. <laughs> I crushed that play. Thanks for your question. Uh, if we could pass the mic back. And if we go to, we'll go, we'll go there so we don't have to run around and then to that one. <clears throat> uh, hi John, my name's Jonathan. Um, hey Jonathan I'm a teacher at a local school local in Nottinghamshire but local enough um, and I listened to your uh, interview on Fake Doctors Real Friends with Zach and Donald and I, I really loved the notion that you were saying about how the lens is, apologies for the language, a bullshit detector and very much cuts through to the core of the actor um, and that's something I very much tried to bring into my students in a lot of the work that we're doing. But I kind of wanted to follow this up further is that as someone who has clearly made such a successful career out of acting, is there any advice you would give to young aspiring actors that are wanting to get involved in theatre, be it on stage or in, uh, in cinema, that you'd give to them? I, I couldn't uh, read for a long time. I had bad dyslexia. And so one way around that, I could hear... I could hear when I reversed words that I was reading. And so I read short stories out loud in the funeral parlor for about five years. And I could hear when I reversed the word. And so I taught myself how to read by listening to myself out loud. And I think there's huge, there was always short stories. Jack London's short stories, Joseph Conrad's short stories, all short stories. <clears throat> and so I would, I, that's a really simple tool to integrate into somebody's kit of reading stuff out loud, not for anybody else, for the, just so you can hear your, what this is a tool, this has to be refined. And I found reading out loud was unbelievably useful. And I just thought of it when you asked that question, but I do, I, I, I'm pretty obsessive compulsive. And so I did it a lot and it worked. If I can follow that up, not to be cheeky now too, but is there any advice you'd give in terms of getting into character, helping create such rich characters with depth? Is there any advice you'd give? No. You, no. <laughs> Worth a shot. It's, it's really hard. 
Because obviously they've not all got the access to kind of go and do these boot camps with all the other uh, kind of police departments and think, I can't take students out right. to uh, different countries, which I try. So, you know, just if there's any advice I could offer. I, I just think reading, re, what I, when I uh, was at school, I, I minored in American literature. I wish that I did one world literature. But I thought there was value in reading what the playwrights, how, what, what, who impacted them, so in other words, you can't do a Tennessee Williams play unless you've read Hart Crane's stuff, because Crane had a huge influence on, on Williams. And so I found reading the, the people who impacted the great playwrights was invaluable, because it almost like it was like you were cut into the front of the line, because you knew exactly what, why Williams in, 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 in Camino Real, why Kilroy is on this endless highway. And it's it's because of where where Hart Crane's characters are, and so there's no way you could know that unless you read Hart Crane, and so I think some American and or British literature uh, is you, you have a chance if you can understand who impacted that writer. So just the historical context that goes with it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Hundred percent. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, if we go over there, then. Hi, John, my name's Paul. Hey, Paul. <clears throat> I was wondering if you had any interesting stories about the musical episode of Scrubs. Will you, uh, I could, will you ask me again, please? Sorry, I speak too fast. Do you have any interesting stories about the episodes of my musical on Scrubs? We got a week to rehearse for it, and we never got a week to rehearse it for anything. The scripts sometimes were slid under the door the day you were shooting. Um, and so much so, that I'll digress for one second. Um, every year, Disney, because we were in a defunct hospital, we weren't on a soundstage, and it, it, it was a hospital, your dressing rooms were traditional old two bed uh, hospital rooms where people were saved and where they died. And that's what your dressing room was. And so every year Disney gave you about 500 bucks to put a coat of paint on it or something. And so one year, the second year, uh, I decided that I was going to take their 500 and add a thousand or two and hire an acoustic firm and have my room soundproof so I didn't have to hear anybody because I was just trying to memorize the lines. So I bring this acoustic firm in and you know, but they put those reverse eggshells, you know, you see them in a recording studio and it kind of muffled the sound outside. But the catalyst for all this was that if uh, people started bringing their dogs to work and they deposited them up on the third floor, which is where the dressing rooms were, hair and makeup was up on the third floor, and wardrobe was on the third floor. And so if you got to bring your dog to work, then she got to bring his dog to work, and soon there were about 30 dogs up on the goddamn third floor. And as karma works, they all ran outside my fucking front door. <laughs> and you did yapping, that fucking yapping. <clears throat> and I'm trying to memorize these insane lists that Billy would write. He just lists of, of, and they were only funny if you said them 500 miles an hour. And so um, I, I went home and I composed a, a letter to HR, to Human Resources at Disney. And then what you're always supposed to do with mad notes is you're supposed to put them in your bureau for three nights. And then if they still resonate, you send them. And in the three, intervening three nights, I realized that there are people who love their dogs more than children. And if I had sent that to HR, uh, I would have been that guy. I didn't want to be that guy. And so in an intervening three days, two people got bit by the dogs. Disney found out, and all the dogs were cleared out. And so I got to throw the note out. But the, the, I, I don't know what made me think of that story, but we had a week to rehearsal for that musical. Everyone had done musicals except for Sarah. Um, and Judy had done musicals, Donald and Zach had done a ton of them. I'd done summer stock for three summers. Uh, and, so, and Kenny, uh, had, he was very musical. Uh, Neil was not, but he's great in, the, the janitor is great in that thing. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic. There was an older director who came on to direct it, Will, some, I can't think of Will's last name right now. Uh, but we, Disney gave us some extra time to do that. And that's what I remember the most that it wasn't a train wreck uh, because it, it, we had a little extra time. In a TV, you have no time. And they brought in somebody to write the music from a show that was on Broadway called Avenue Q. And the woman who's the patient 
had been nominated for a Tony in Avenue Q, and she was astonishing. And so you record the music the week before, and then on the day, they press playback, and you lip sync to that. And uh, it was great. Every, everyone was very musical in that ensemble. And so it, it, it kind of felt like putting on a glove. It felt pretty good. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Lady in the White there. And then over to here. Hi, I'm uh, Hannah from a few miles down the road. So thank you for coming. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Um, what was your funniest moment filming Scrubs? Was there a scene that for you, you remember laughing whilst trying to deliver or? Whenever I forget a line, no matter where I am on the planet, um, and before anybody can say anything, I just scream the word again. And there is a gag reel of me just screaming again, because I don't want the set to fall apart. I don't want, I know I forgot the line. I never forget lines, but when I do, I scream, again! And the whole set stops. Everyone stops fucking around because I probably forgot the line because this one over here was calling her mother. Um, and I just, I don't look at anyone who is doing it. I just go, again! And we go again. And after a while, people stop taking it seriously because I'm such a jackass. And uh, that, then Donald and Zach, anytime I said again, they would, of course, go, again! <laughs> direct it, direct it. Direct my threat. I had no threat. I have no threat. And it made me laugh. And just taking the piss out of that was kind of genius. I remember that. Uh, 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 other funny things are, I, I, don't, I don't mess around on sets. I don't, they all prank each other and do all that shit. And I throw things at people when they prank me. And I, I, it means I've spelt the, spent the last 12 hours trying to learn this scene. And if, if somebody messes around, it pushes my buttons. I have no control. And, and I figure, you know, Malkovich, who I met through uh, Johnny Cusack, um, just can't abide people doing that on the sets. And I, I spent some time with John and he, he just thinks that everyone, everyone here wants to get home to their families. And so a 10 hour day doesn't have to be a 14 hour day because uh, this one over here is playing games. And so I, I guess I, 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 I believe that. It doesn't mean I'm not having fun and I wanna do all this stuff. But I, I don't think we all have to act like 11 year olds. Um, and, you know, it, I, the, a, a funny version of it that, that we had to problem solve is that Sarah, who's my dear friend and I love, um, who played Elliot, uh, is a klutz. And she's super klutzy at lunch. And she's so animated and she gets everything so going and she has 9,000 things she's talking about at once. She is a chronic spiller. And so she used to spill her stuff on her wardrobe. You know, stuff would spill. And so wardrobe, they outlawed her bringing her wardrobe to lunch. She had to, and so we got her a series of like clown suits um, <laughs> because it was just unbelievable that she was a spiller at 30, however old she was, 25. And uh, God love her, she played along. She's the best, she's the best. You've, you've worked with um, some great comedians as well. With, with, uh, up with um, Brooklyn as well, you're working with Andy Samberg and some of the scenes that you're doing with him and Andre, uh, they're amazing. Uh, have, you got, have you got funny moments from there as well? Or is it, uh, is it, is it all pro really professional? Because it just seems like you're- COVID, COVID stole you. the day. There wasn't time for uh, fraternizing and really even getting to know each other to tell you the truth because everyone was shuttled out to their safe spaces mm. once somebody called cut. You know, you were sent over there, I was sent to this tent. And the fact that they make the show so amazing is such a tip of the cap to that ensemble. But I, I'm, af I'm afraid I didn't get to know people on that. I regret it, but it was nice to have a gig in the middle of COVID. Mm. Uh, next question, if we've got the, um, there's a lady over here and to the front. Oh, there you go, there we go, second row. Hi, I'm Louise. I'm from Scotland. Hello, Louise. <laughs> Hiya. Um, like so many people's favourite character is Dr. Cox. Who's your favourite character in Scrubs? 
Who's my favorite character in Scrubs? Dr. Cox. No, but you can't see him. <laughs> Not him. You can't see him. <laughs> Um, I, th I thought Kenny, the head of the hospital, who I became dear friends with, uh, uh, as, he, as we progressed along, uh, Bill Lawrence, the writer of the show, called him a comedy assassin. And what he meant was he, they, they just gave him drive-bys. And a drive-by is uh, Kelso would just walk through the frame, throw something over his shoulder, and destroy with maybe four syllables. And, so, and that's really hard. It's really hard, and Kenny made it look like it was no big deal. And so I not only became very dear friends with Kenny, I, I also know how hard it was that what he was doing, and it made me admire him a great deal. Because that character could have been a, just uh, so superfluous and redundant, and Kenny didn't let it be. He was so lovely, uh, and Kelso is intense, but I thought Kenny rounded, you know what, when you bullnose a piece of furniture, it means rounding corners. I thought he bullnosed Kelso just enough, just enough. Pose your question, um, just on the front here. Just down here. <clears throat> it's all right. Hi, I'm uh, Jason from Scotland as well, actually. Hey, um, Jason. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, um, when you were having to play roles where, say for instance, you're having to play a bad guy where you're having to intimidate the likes of Sylvester Stallone and get Carter or Sean Connery in The Rock. Do you find yourself having to kind of try and beef yourself up and make yourself more imposing? Did you work out more or to be that I, more I have. I have for, I didn't forget Carter, but I have for, uh, for a bunch of different stuff. I've put on and taken off weight. Um, I, I, I feel I can connect to things with a sense of physicality. I, like I did this one film that nobody saw, and unfortunately it wasn't as good as the script, called Highway. It was originally called a Leonard Cohen Afterworld, which is a Kurt Cobain lyric that Courtney wouldn't let the producers use. And it's Jared, uh, Jared, Jared, what's his name, Jared Leto, and Jake Gyllenhaal, and Selma Blair, and myself, and we're all four, from different circumstances, and we wind up in a car going from Vegas to uh, Kurt Cobain's funeral. And so in some, those are called road movies. And so, like, The Wizard of Oz is a road movie. There are four different characters. And so what happens with the movies like that is it's, it's, it's on the director to get those four different people into the same film because tone-wise, and unfortunately that didn't happen in Highway, but I had lost 53 pounds for that. I went from about 207 during um, any given Sunday down in Miami with, with Al and all the football players. And I decided that, that this guy had to be around 150 because he was, he was a dope dealer and he probably, he probably dipped into his own stash and he was very hyped up. And I also, I wanted to have these Jim Morrison leather pants dripping off my hips. And the only way to do that is to get skinny. And so I made it, <clears throat> I made it right to about 150. I never got below it. And it was the most miserable six months of my life. Because <laughs> the only way to do that is not eat. And so I was drinking this green juice with all that chlorophyll. It's very healthy. But I just, I was miserable. And I remember people, you know, in California, every, you know, a lot of people are really holistic and vegan and you should fucking eat this way, man. And I'm like, well, I'm coming off. They're like, well, do a cleanse, man. And I'm like, well, I'm not doing a cleanse. I'm starving. And they're like, <laughs> okay, well, listen, man, when you come off of that, be careful, man, be gentle. And I was like, fuck you, I'm having chicken wings. I'm fucking <laughs> starving. They're like, well, you'll spin out. I'm like, I'm spinning out, I didn't spin out. My body was like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. So yes, a sense of physicality, if possible, if there's enough time, uh, I really like to apply that. Thank you. Cheers. Any more questions? Oh, you've done it. We've got, yeah, we'll say, let's go. Let's go one, two there in the front. Let's get the front done quickly. I have to be quick because we've got 10 minutes now. So. Hi, I'm Stu. Hey, Stu. Um, what thought goes into voice acting? Because I know you do a couple of... Will you start over, please? Sorry, what thought goes into voice acting? Because obviously you're a very physical voice. Um, what thought goes into how much of it's from the character, how much of it from yourself? When I do animated characters, yeah. it's, it's really in, in <clears throat> the close confines of what is a recording stage. There's somebody behind the glass right there. They're driving the ship. 
And so you bring, you, I call it guess your best. You bring a cavalcade of eccentricities, since you already have the gig. And uh, if he, you know, you can bring a Southern sound and maybe they want that, or maybe they want them from Brooklyn. Uh, and you bring those and maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, if, that, if that voice director is good, if he or she is good, you, you'll find the sound. But it's, it's, they're in charge. In in doing doing animation, they're usually some that man or woman's a badass, and I mean in a good way, and it's it's on them, and they mix it up, and hopefully you can get there. Usually do. Cool, thanks. I just want to pass it down to them. Hi, I'm Kareem. Hey, Kareem. Um, hi. So on Scrubs, there's so many. Uh, I don't know. I guess you'd call them secondary characters, like the janitor, Todd, yeah. and and and. They're Ted. my favorite. Yeah, they they all make me absolutely cry. But um, uh, Sam Lloyd, who sadly passed, who Rest plays Ted, he um, every single scene he's ever in made me fold up laughing. Same and here. I, and I just wondered if, uh, hopefully, he was as nice on set. But I just wondered if you had any memories about him. He's like the show. janitor. He's like Neil. They when they open their mouth, they're funny. They're both trained as improvisational actors. <clears throat> uh, Sam was also a great musician, obviously uh, singing that a cappella group. And he, between Neil and Sam, was the most times people would break up in the scene, It'd fall apart. Uh, he, Sam passed a little while ago and he destroyed, and he also destroyed the writers. And so if you can kill the writers, they can write for you. Yeah. and. Uh, if the writers have no idea what you're doing, then you'll get scripts that don't make sense. And Sam would take their stuff and just turn it up. He was really gifted. You can't, Thank like you. that, like that, Sam Lloyd, where's my teacher friend? You can't teach that. He's just, he just had that. Neil just has it. And they did all that improvisational stuff and they could bring it to the set and problem solve on a dime. That's awesome, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Kareem. Uh, hands up again. It was, <clears throat> if you just want to pass it backwards, we'll go, those two, there are two guys there. Yep. Let's pass it down. There you go. <laughs> and then we'll pass it over to there. Um, the my name's Billy. Hey, Billy. Um, Scrubs is very much like a comfort series of mine. Like, you can just rewatch it endlessly. It can be on in the background. Like, you can, it's just comfort. So I was just wondering, do you have any more, do you have any of those yourself? Like a comfort film or series you just stick on and, you know it that well that it just relaxes I'm a, I'm a, you. It's a good question. I'm a total TV junkie. I love, I love watching. Now you can binge. You know, now with all these streaming services, you can binge something. Um, I, I don't know. I have to think about that for a second. I, I, the Wire, I would put way up there, although it's not that fucking comforting. Um, <laughs> but, but I would, I would put that up there. Stun against I, evil. <clears throat> say again. Stun against evil. Would that be on there? Yeah. Well, Stan. Yeah, I would watch, I love Stan, but I watched it so much cutting it that it's, it's different. Um, I, I would put The Sopranos up there, but it's funny, I watched The Sopranos again a couple of years ago, and because Edie and, and, and Jimmy are so great, some of the secondary characters suck. That it's, we, we've watched The Sopranos again, no well, disrespect well, to a, them. There's a new film out, isn't there? Have you seen that? Yeah, the, well? Many Saints of Newark, I can't wait to see it. Um, but. Uh, the, the tricky things with The Sopranos is some of those non-actors, it's when you get in the same frame as Edie or Jim, uh, <laughs> that's a tricky bargain. Let's moving on to the, the guy next. Hi, John, I'm Gavin. Hey, Gavin. Hi, you there. Um, <clears throat> is there any particular Scrubs episode um, which was your favorite or is there an episode which resonates, resonates emotion, the most emotionally for you? I thought when Billy wrote the one about the three losing the three patients uh, and that roller coaster ride that Cox get to go on, and then the episode that followed it where Cox won't leave his apartment and he's just boozing, uh, I thought that was really good television. It was brilliant that one. I really thought the pa what was on the page for us to take up a notch was a gift. Absolutely. I, I thought Cox had earned that. It, it, I think it was season five or six. I can't remember, but that felt earned. Definitely. Um, just one quickie. Um, Dr. Perry Cox is not very keen on Hugh Jackman. Do you like Hugh Jackman? <laughs> no, I mean, Billy, Billy, yes, I've never met you, but the, the whole thing about Hugh Jackman to hear from Billy, which I heard him describe on, on Fake Doctor's Real Friends, Zach and Donald's podcast, is that he just was jealous that Hugh could do anything. 
but he was so goddamn good looking. He had just won a, a Tony for whatever show he was doing on Broadway. He was freaking Wolverine. Uh, he's so handsome, it's embarrassing. And I think Billy was just writing from inadequacy. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave it to Cox, who's Mr. Inadequate. Thank you, John. Cheers. Coming. Hi, John, my name is Jake. Hey, Jake. Um, I just want to know if there was like a favorite moment with JD, like a favorite rant, like all the moments that you're, you're inspiring him or telling him off for. <laughs> I thought that list, that, that list we did, at the, I can't remember which one, uh, where he talks about all the things he cares about less than him becoming a doctor, <laughs> which is such an ass backwards way into a, a, a way to insult somebody. I, I, that was pretty good. And Zach was pretty great listening to it and, and absorbing the blows. Do you have a favorite girl name for him? No. <laughs> no. Thank you. Somebody, I saw somebody once on YouTube or somewhere put together every single name that Cox called uh, Zachy. And it wasn't, it, when I watched it, it seemed insane. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen yourself in the mirror, John? Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Jake. And this guy in the chat shirt. Hey, uh, my name's Alex. I'm actually from Buffalo, New York. I don't oh, know right how, on. I don't know how I got over here. Um, <clears throat> Why wouldn't you? <laughs> so uh, with how professional you say you are on set, I know from the podcast, Donald uh, had a lot of trouble with lines sometimes and just coming in drunk sometimes. No, when Donald was never drunk. He was just high. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, did you ever, like, lose it on him, or did you try and ever help him? That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. That's not my thing. I, I started... Year six, we started having a bunch of guest stars who came in, or, or year seven, <clears throat> and they didn't know their lines. And they got like a, a six or seven episode run. And there were a couple of them who I, I did a very bad thing to, uh, and I promise I won't do it anymore. But um, there's, there's miniatures are smaller versions of your script, uh, scripted pages, and everyone brings their miniatures to the uh, master, the big shot. And then by the time you're done shooting the master and you come in for your single, you should, you should at least know your lines, even if you didn't look at them last night, because you shot them in the master probably five or six times. And when people bring their miniatures into the, their coverage, um, and so let's say we shot the master, then we do my coverage, and you have had now probably four hours, to, now we're gonna turn around and get your coverage. And so if the person doesn't know their lines by then and they, have, they bring their, their miniatures into the frame, I started telling them, you know what you should do for your, your single? Keep the miniatures in the frame because we're going to be on me listening because it's infinitely more interesting than watching you struggle for your fucking words. So, and they'd be like, and actors, when you, they're like, really? And I'm like, no, not really. We're going to be on you, so learn your lines. And they start learning the lines. But that's not my job. I don't want to be a babysitter. It's exhausting. I have, I have three kids and a 24-year-old with special needs. I don't want to be a babysitter with somebody else on set. And uh, I just can't process it when people don't know the lines. As a 60, I'm, I'm pathetic. As a 62-year-old, I can't process it. It just seems anathema to me to come to a set and not know your lines. Thank you. And Absolutely. I know that's hardcore, but it's the way I feel. So that's, that wraps up the uh, Q&A session. Uh, thanks once again for John C. McGinley. A big round of applause for our guest tonight.